Great, so we're gonna start it up. I'm gonna introduce our moderator really quick. Karen Vates is a literacy advocate and children's advocate who lives in New York City. Before founding Edge of Aids, her advocacy firm, she was the founding chief evangelist at high quality curriculum provider, Open Up Resources, and previously served at Student Achievement Partners. Today, she works with multiple leading literacy nonprofits around efforts to align reading instruction with evidence and research on how kids learn to read. Welcome, Karen, and welcome, guests. Thank you, Taria, and I'm the least interesting person here on this stage, so um, I want to get right into introductions quickly. But I definitely think that this is the most important session today because it's grounded in people that are doing this work in schools. Um, so it is an absolute pleasure to introduce our panelists today, Ann Botticelli, who's the Chief Academic Officer in Buffalo Public Schools, Kathleen Chaucer, the Principal at uh, Milton Elementary Terrace in Boston Spa, New York, and Julie Weber, who's the Director of Curriculum and Instruction uh, in Medina Central. Um, and there's absolutely no substitute for hearing from people doing this on the ground. So thank you to all of you for being here with us today. Um, we're gonna start by going through everyone's science of reading learning journey and hearing from each of our panelists about what's happening in their districts, what's been changing, um, so that you all have a, a general sense when we get to questions. But before we dive into that, I want to let you know we've really optimized our time together to hear from you and what you want to hear from our panelists. So we'll go through a couple of questions that we've prepared to share, but sometime around kind of 30 minutes or so into our time together, we're going to shift to audience questions. Um, Taria, if you have a particular way that folks should share their audience questions, I don't know if there's a mic being passed or anything, we'll... We're going to have mics ready. We'll have mics ready. So. So please be jotting down your questions as we go because we're going to get to that quite quick. Um, but we asked Anne if she would start us off with sharing her science of reading and learning journey. Um, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I don't know how many people were still or were already in teaching back in reading first, um, but that is sort of the beginning of our district's journey. Um, in the beginning, we had a lot to do. We didn't have a standard program. Everybody was doing their own thing. Um, we didn't have a screening measure. We had to train every single elementary teacher in um, administering dibbles. I don't know if anybody uses dibbles. Do you remember Palm Pilots? Okay, so that's where, we actually started paper and pencil and then transitioned to Palm Pilots and we thought we were cutting edge. So that was, that was a very big deal for us. Um, we got our feet wet with reading first. We worked with CORE, the Consortium on Reading Excellence. Um, and that was a really good introduction to us with the five pillars of literacy was something that wasn't really familiar at the time in our district. Um, we moved to uh, letters, so the language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, which I strongly recommend if you are on this journey and you really want to go deeply into the science of reading. You got a little bit, a uh, taste of it today from the previous speaker, um, but it's an excellent, excellent platform. Um, you know, things like Common Core came and we took a little bit of a pause, I, I would say, and spent some time doing other initiatives. But since I've been in this role, we have sort of come back to the, to the table and really said how important it is for us to stay focused on the science of reading. My wonderful supervisor of reading is hiding there in the back, Barb Fassel, but she and her counterpart, Jane Burns, our director, um, really helped lead this work. We took on um, writing. We realized our writing instruction really needed some support. So we went with Step Up to Writing, which is a very explicit model. We initially started with our L's and then transitioned it across the district. We trained every teacher in the entire district, K-12. Um, we moved on to do a much deeper dive with, the, with letters. And so we've trained, or in the process of training, every K-4 teacher, including ENL, special education, reading teachers, classroom teachers. And that gave us an excellent foundation to build on. Last year, we started with Orton Gillingham, so we are in the process of training all of our reading teachers, literacy coaches, special education teachers K-8, all kindergarten teachers and ENL teachers um, in Orton Gillingham. We're going to be using it as an intervention, but also as, our, as part of the core in kindergarten. And we just started morphology training, which is phenomenal. So if anyone is interested, I'm happy to talk about that later. But I think it, it helps build upon um, the students' understanding of vocabulary acquisition and when they approach text, learning how to translate that into writing as well. So that's where we are right now. So, um, so I work in Boston Spa and that is located about 30 miles north of Albany. 
Um, we began our journey in 2017 through 2018. We um, ultimately, um, like many folks here, we were a balanced literacy district. When I was hired in 2002, we were a reading recovery district um, and balanced literacy. I was hired because of my knowledge of balanced literacy and then um, also as an administrator, I was hired because of my knowledge of balanced literacy. Um, we got a new superintendent. Um, his name is Ken Slentz. He was a deputy commissioner with John King. Um, he came to us in 2017-18, and he really kindly and gently um, taught us about this other way of teaching reading and that this whole body of research was out there that we didn't know about. So um, our journey began uh, first just learning and growing and understanding what this other way was, and um, also some mourning and some grieving, as I'm sure many of you have done when you <laughs> learn about this new way. Um, and then we um, put together a curriculum selection team and the team ultimately um, was given four or five choices of high quality curriculum materials. It was a comprehensive team of teachers and administrators from across the district and ultimately they selected bookworms. Um, we were hoping they would select wit and wisdom. Some of us just because we were already teaching foundations and that's a, you know, uh, there's a, a strong connection there. But our teachers felt really strongly that the literacy was so authentic and rich, the literature in bookworms that they chose it. Um, by the time a fifth grader leaves fifth grade with bookworms, students have read just under 300 full texts. So, um, and we are thrilled that they did choose it. We have just had a great experience with it. We also teach some fund foundations in Haggerty and K2. Um, we are um, continuing to support the implementation through um, literacy coaching and continued PD. Um, we're in our fourth year of implementation, but like just like the teacher in last night's video that um, implemented bookworms um, the year of the pandemic, we were having this great momentum and we were so excited to get that end of the year data and then the shutdown happened. So, and then the year after that was not also a um, normal year. So we're really looking forward to this year's data. We're seeing great results. We're really proud of our teachers and um, community for really coming around us and um, we're just excited about our continued work. I love it, and thank you. I was gonna make sure that folks connected those dots between the inspiring teacher story we saw last night, Bookworm's, um, you know, Soapbox Speech is just such a great curriculum, one of the many that I hope folks in the room are starting to check out. Um, and over to Julian Medina. Okay, um, there we go. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Julie Weber from the Medina Central School District. Um, of the three of us, we are definitely the smallest district. We only have just under 1,400 students. Um, we're considered rather rural, right on the Erie Canal. Um, and we're 60% economically disadvantaged, so we have quite a, um, you know, conglomerate that we're working with. But the one thing to say is that we definitely have hardworking teachers, um, and I think that's probably the most important piece in our story is because that's how we ended up even approaching the science of reading was because we had such hardworking teachers who noticed they were working very hard but our students weren't making progress. Right off the chin. Um, they weren't making progress. So, um, you know, we were using F and P and balanced literacy and all of that as well. So. Uh, the, the department chairs actually came forward and said, hey, can we look into something different? And that was when we found the Reading League. Um, and so we've partnered with them just since January of 2020. So we've really been building um, teachers' knowledge over the last few years. And this year's really our full implementation phase where we've had to change our assessments and take a look at different resources and things like that. Um, and I think one of the, the biggest um, change makers that we've had is we've brought in a reading coach from the Reading League, Stacy Pelicano, who's here today as well. Um, and we've never really used the coaching model much before in Medina. So I think um, from the slide that was shared with us earlier as to how coaching can be such a, a plus, uh, we're definitely seeing that as well because it takes practice and it takes time. So we're still on our, our journey, um, but it's exciting to start to see some results. So everyone's in the midst of this journey at different points in the journey, um, different points relative to how long you've been at it, different points relative to which parts of the transition you've made and investments in curriculum versus professional learning. Um, 
so with that as backdrop though, um, when we were preparing, I heard all these awesome stories out of each of your districts about um, how your teachers and leaders have responded to these changes. And I would just love for you to share with the group, uh, you know, how your teachers and leaders have responded and what lets you know you're going in the right direction. Um, so I would say we've had a couple trainings that have been exceptionally well received. One of those was step up to writing. So I remember teachers being ecstatic when we started that and they still to this day love step up to writing because previously we didn't have any systematic way to instruct. Um, people were doing six traits of writing. Um, other people just were afraid to teach writing because we didn't really get a lot of that background um, when we were trained. So having a program that they could use, refer to, it was consistent across every department. So social studies, English, science. People felt very comfortable with it and it was a great rollout. Our Orton-Gillingham rollout has been phenomenally well received across Every teacher that I talk to raves about that program. They're so excited. So there's a few things that we've done that can, they tell me that we're heading in the right direction. When I walk around classrooms and see kids using decodables instead of leveled readers, I'm, I'm a very happy camper. When I walk around and look at the walls and I can see the higher order thinking questions that we wrote and watch kids using the step up to writing method to answer those questions, I'm very excited. So there's a lot of things that have been happening that um, give me that idea, that sense that we are moving in the right direction. So I would say similarly in Boston Spa, we are seeing some really exciting um, indicators that we're moving in a good direction. Um, first and foremost, I would say our data is looking great. Um, prior to um, implementing an, a high quality curriculum, uh, we were still very data driven. It was not the correct data, now we understand that. We were looking at a lot of FNP data and data that wasn't really informing what we should be doing. Uh, but now that we have this high quality curriculum and some really solid assessments, we're able to see relatively quickly that what we're doing is working and that is the most exciting thing. Um, when our, super, our superintendent has since um, taken a new position, but when he would come to do a check-in with me, my reading teachers would see him and run down and grab their data and come back and wait outside the door for it to open so they could just quickly have a moment to show him. And, you know, of course, he's thrilled and we're thrilled. It's just really exciting. Um, I think the thing that I'm most proud of for my teachers is that they have they have taken this and run with it, so they have continued their own learning and they're also starting to become advocates. So we have a teacher who just got the Goyen Fellowship and so she is um, working with the Goyen Foundation to make sure that we're getting the work that she's doing out um, onto social media so that other people can see it and can learn from her and that's something we're really proud of. Um, we've got another teacher who applied for the fellowship and didn't get it, was still speaking with them yesterday and working on ways that we can still continue to get the work out. Um, there's a text chain that I'm on with my reading teachers and they will pretty frequently text me information like, did you read this article on orthographic mapping or can you believe this? And I just take a moment, I'm just so proud that that's our conversation, that that's where we are as educators and that we're all continuing to le learn and grow together. I love that, and if you aren't following this account, this Milton, Milton Terrace Elementary Reading handle, it's fabulous. At the end of the panel, Kathleen and I can both share one of their tweets because every time they post, it just gives you a sense of the power of this work. Um, Julie. So as I stated, we're only a couple of years in, and I can't say that it's all been joys. Um, there, there's, it's tough work, and it takes time. A lot of some of our uh, hiccups along the way are similar to ones that you've already heard about today. We had a lot of staff who were like, but, but I already know what I'm doing. I've, I've done this for so long. Or I already have a master's degree in literacy. You're not telling me what I learned. You know, so there was a lot of that. So it's taken persistence and patience for sure. We're starting to take a look at our data um, and we're seeing some slow growth. And I like to, uh, I'm, I love to use analogies for everything. So my analogy for oral reading fluency is that it's kind of like a stage performance. You can't just jump up on stage and put on a performance and have it come out perfectly. You have to memorize your lines, you have to practice your intonation and the choreography and have your costumes and your hairstyles and everything come together at once. And that's kind of where we're at right now. We're seeing amazing growth in phonemic awareness. 
we're seeing great growth in phonics. But when you take a look at the oral reading fluency measure, the growth might not be as big because we're, we're getting there with accuracy. Accuracy is amazing, but we're not quite to automaticity, not quite to fluency yet. So, you know, if you were to look at it on a graph, you might say, hmm, show me where this is working. But when you look at the individual pieces, it is working. So I'm excited to give it, you know, a few more years when we start to see all of those pieces come together and we have a wonderful stage performance and fluent readers. <laughs> That's my analogy. Um, but it's been interesting because, uh, especially even with decodable readers, you know, we had beautiful classroom libraries of level text for students, um, but we knew that we had to get some decodables. Of course, there's a cost involved. So to try and make it more affordable, we purchased sets and put them in our library so that teachers could get them from the library as they needed them. And the librarian said, well, they're not very interesting. Why are we putting these in kids' hands? And it's like, well, <laughs> because of the purpose that they're serving, it's more for the phonics-based piece as opposed to the you know, love of literature kind of thing with decodables. So that was where we knew that we had to educate all, not just our classroom teachers, but we have involved our paraprofessionals in trainings with the Reading League. We've involved the library. You know, everyone is involved so that as we have conversations about our journey, we have a common language among the adults as well. So like I said, it's a, it's a journey. We're, we're still uh, in progress, but it's exciting to see the growth. When you say common language, I thought about that during the last presentation because that was like a, a blitz of letters. And she was throwing out graphemes and phonemes and all the kinds of words I did not understand when we started this. I had no idea what that meant. I think I reread some of my letters manuals 20 times before I could process exactly what that meant. But now everybody speaks the same language, K4. They all know what we mean. If I say grapheme, they all know exactly what I'm talking about. And I think that's key. Yeah, and like I said, when I said we had everybody involved in the training, that included all of our administrators. I sat right next to the teachers and learned it as well, because I'll admit, I was the elementary principal when we started. Um, I didn't know what a lot of those terms were, so I was learning as well. And I was a former French and Spanish teacher, so it helped me to have that Velcro <laughs> to attach this to, um, you know, in my background knowledge to help me learn in the journey too. I love that, and that's a great segue to our next question. This knowledge is Velcro. We heard from Natalie Wexler at today's um, fantastic lunch keynote, and we know the science of reading conversation has given all kinds of airtime, you know, in the national media. It's been hard to miss to the foundational skills discussion, and so many districts are still. Uh, I think many districts in the science of reading arena are, you know, maybe started there and are starting to move into some of these other arenas that also weren't investment. So we thought we would take a little time to um, ask each of our panelists what you all are doing to uh, invest in and, and develop that comprehension um, side of the reading rope, if you will. So I did love that earlier um, dialogue about writing and how important writing is, because I fundamentally <laughs> agree with that. Um, if you can't spell, you're going to have disfluency when it comes to writing, so we know how important that is. So the phonics leads to the spelling, right? Those are connected, they're you know, both exceptionally important. And then when you become a fluent writer, you also need to have a mastery of vocabulary. So right now we're doing a lot of training with morphology. All of our three through sixth grade teachers are going to be going through um, a five-day morphology training. So they'll be focusing on Greek and Latin and prefixes and suffixes and the base words. Um, we're get, trying to build oral vocabulary, so really having that conversation about how important that is, because those things lead to comprehension, right? So you need to have the vocabulary knowledge, you need to have the content knowledge. At one point, we had to take a step back and insist that everybody teach science and social studies at the elementary, um, because there was, you know, there, there was that reading first push, and people prioritized math and reading, and we saw that in content knowledge. So it was very important for us to take a step back and make sure that every elementary student had a set time for science and social studies instruction. Um, so a lot of those things, I think, build. Having the vocabulary, having the opportunity to build the background knowledge, having a solid understanding of writing. 
we use junior grade books um, for a lot of our RTI, so students who don't necessarily need intervention may participate in our junior grade books program at that time. Um, we've written higher order thinking questions to accompany the text that we use, and we really encourage teachers to use those in combination with our writing strategies. Um, so I see us moving in that direction. We're, go we're going to be adopting a new series pretty soon. Um, so we're anxious to see what everybody else has, and it's been really great talking to my peers up here about the programs that they're using. So I would say for us in Boston Spa, um, one of the things that I didn't understand and that my team didn't understand when we implemented was the profound impact of a solid tier one instruction. We, for years, would sit around our child's study table and try to intervene our way out of the problem, but we did not understand that, in fact, what needed to happen was that we needed to have tier one um, really solid and systematic and um, uh, consistent. And so that has done a lot um, towards the comprehension side of the reading rope. Um, the Bookworms uh, literature or literacy curriculum is great because it is a knowledge building curriculum. We were very excited that it was one of the ones that Natalie mentioned in the back of her book. <laughs> we're very proud when Bookworms is mentioned because it does not get a lot of airtime. <laughs> um, but it is knowledge, uh, knowledge building and it is, you know, like I said, very authentic literature. Um, the other thing is that it is um, written by a researcher and so there are some really sophisticated pieces to it that we were really impressed with. Um, for example, at the kindergarten level there's a part that's called the dialogic, which is explicit teaching of um, language, and it explicitly scripts for teachers what they should be saying, and it's very rich around the shared reading component, and that's a piece that some of our most veteran, outstanding teachers have said that they have felt like they are much more effective because it's really telling them exactly how to talk about the books and how to really be fed up for some of our students who don't come to us having been read to. Um, so I think there are a lot of pieces right within our tier one that have really helped to support the comprehension. In Medina, I think we've really been trying to integrate all of our content areas as much as possible. We're working a lot on curriculum writing um, to take a look and see how to put all of these pieces together uh, into a sound curriculum moving forward, and then finding the right resources to support what it is that we want to do. Um, and I think building vocabulary is a big focus that we've had, and that kind of goes along with, you know, they can use some of their other skills that they've been learning. The teachers, not even so much the students, but the teachers can use some of the skills they've been learning, whether it's in morphology, things like that, to help our students build their vocabulary. And as we continue moving forward to take a look at more resources, we want to find something that really puts that all together. And, and like Anne said, it's been nice talking with our peers to hear about bookworms and hear about Step Up to Reading, because I think there it, it is so much to learn and it would be nice to have something that kind of puts it all together for you. Right now we have a lot of kind of, um, I don't know if I want to say piecemeal, but a lot of pieces that we're trying to put together. And that's why, like I said on my slide, we have hardworking teachers because they've learned the why, they've learned the reason why we need to be doing this, um, and now we're really trying to, to put together the how. So, Great segue, this, this theme about how important it is to hear from your peers. So I hope that everyone in the audience has been preparing your questions because this is gonna be our last actually planned question for our group. Um, and I think our friend who, who has the microphone up front, um, if folks have questions, would you like people to come to you and line up or? So she'll circulate and when we move to questions, just be ready to throw your hand up and share a question with the group. Maybe folks can actually put one up now so that you can find that first person. But our last prepared question at the moment will be, uh, we would love for you to just quickly share what's next for you in your plans on your journey with the science of reading before we turn to audience questions. Um, so we are this year rolling out our student success plan. Um, if you're welcome to come look at it online. Um, but we've laid out our expectations for instruction in the district and then how we're going to support people. So some of our expectations is that um, Orton-Gillingham will be an intervention that we use consistently across the district at the elementary level. Um, and we're providing that training. We've trained our coaches as well, so they'll be able to support teachers in the classroom. 
Um, like I said, we are doing a new reading adoption, so we're going to be investigating what's out there and looking for the most appropriate program for the district, which would include a structured literacy component. Um, and morphology, so this is our first year. We, we have a cohort that's um, in training right now <laughs> on Saturday. So we, I have about 200 teachers, I think, at training today, we, either in morphology, Orton-Gillingham, or numbers, which is the math counterpart to letters. Um, so they're all learning today. Um, we're closely monitoring, just taking a peek at the screen to see how they're doing. <laughs> but um, so that is our current plan. We are going to be revisiting our student success plan every quarter just to make sure we're on the right track. Um, and we're going to be looking at our data and making sure that we are moving in the right direction. And we'll have to course correct if we're not. But so far, so good. So I would say we are in our fourth year of implementation. So our plan moving forward is to just keep it moving. <laughs> so we're continuing to support our teachers in the implementation, really looking to refine pieces that teachers may want some reteaching in. For example, in Bookworms, um, shared reading is one of the 45 minute blocks and it's very sophisticated and specific around how we do that. And so some teachers have asked if they could have some reteaching in that area. We're also just continuing to provide professional development on it any items that come up um, that teachers are interested in and really just continuing to support our teachers and to celebrate our successes. Um, we definitely use the Scarborough Rope graph infographic as kind of like a, a bit of a guide. So, you know, we're continuing to learn about all of the different strands of that rope. So that's definitely what's next is we do have several more trainings this year with the Reading League. Um, I would say that we're moving from the phase of vulnerability to confidence and celebration. Um, when we started, a lot of our teachers were, you know, very vulnerable and admitting that they didn't know what they didn't know. Um, and they were willing to try. And like I said, with the help of our coach Stacy, you know, getting in there and really assisting them, that now they're starting to feel much more confident. And so I want to give our teachers a chance to celebrate with one another because there's still a few resistant people. Um, but I think when they start to see the, the confidence and celebration of their colleagues, that that's going to help the message spread even further. All right, I think we have our first audience question. Hi. This, my name is Kathleen, and it's to Kathleen. You said that you were looking at the F and that you are looking at F and P data, and now you're, you're, you have new assessments that's giving you more insights. What, is, what are those assessments? Sure, so, so great question. Um, okay, great question. So we are, um, we use um, uh, these data spreadsheets and we meet at the end of every intervention cycle and re review data on every child and see how they did. So we are looking at Dibble's progress monitoring, um, iReady data, um, assessments within bookworms. I'm looking to my literacy coach. Oh yeah, the IDI. For students receiving intervention. Um, as part of Bookworms, we have a differentiation block, um, which is another book that was by Sharon Walpole, who also wrote Bookworms. And if you look online, it's how to differentiate reading instruction, and anybody could use that book, even if you're not using Bookworms, and it really hones in on uh, what skill, so if our kids aren't fluent, then we give them the informal decoding inventory and it pinpoints exactly what deficit skill area they're in and then we have, we have our reading teachers give them the tier three explicit instruction in that particular area. So it's all, you know, it has the assessment right in there and it has all the lessons right there done for you and it's supposed to be designated for 15 minutes of time and that's it. So it, it's created an amazing increase in our data. I have to say, our, most of our kids are decoders now. Now we're just transitioning to being fluent and comprehending, so it's been amazing. And in that book, Walpole and McKenna have a staircase of, com a staircase of complexity with how students learn to read, and so we're pinpointing the constrained skill and then moving them up that staircase. So we just feel like we're doing a lot more targeted intervention instead of just kind of generally working on getting them to a level G or whatever. Thanks. 
So I, I had sort of a follow-up question, uh, again, uh, for, for Kathleen um, on bookworms. I guess it's a two-part question. So I'd like to know more about the comprehension assessments that I guess are part of the bookworms curriculum or that come with the bookworms curriculum. Because I, I think one problem with progress monitoring of comprehension is all of those tests just tell you about discrete disconnected skills rather than embedding it in content that kids may have learned. And so I don't, I, I, I've seen bookworms in action in one school district, but I did not ask this question about those comprehension assessments or, I mean, I would just call them like assessments of like, did you learn the content and can you think about it in different ways? And the other question, again, about bookworms, so the uh, district that I visited that was using bookworms happened to be in Delaware, and they were, I mean, this was developed at the University of Delaware under Sharon Walpole, so they were lucky enough, they were close enough to the University of Delaware that they were getting professional development support from the people who created the curriculum. And I wonder what kind of professional development you've been able to get to support the implementation of bookworms. Super. So I'm going to answer that question and then I'm going to pass it to my <laughs> uh, literacy coach because she's smiling at me knowing that she th I probably would need some help with that. So, so first and foremost, I would say we were so lucky to get on board early with Bookworms. Again, our teachers selected it because they were really excited about the literature. So we were able to work very closely with Sharon Walpole. I'm so proud to say she came to our school and she and her coaches taught in my school to my students and modeled for our teachers. It was just a wonderful opportunity for us. Sharon would, she even sat with us and brainstormed specific students who we were struggling with and directly coached my teachers on how to you know, move those kids along. Like she knew some of my kids by first name. Obviously she didn't know the child, but she just knew like their data and was giving us some really good information. And we have, you know, like one kid I'm thinking about just her whole life changed because of Sharon. You know, we were able to um, figure out pretty quickly with Sharon that it was in fact a fluency problem. The child was dys dyslexic. Sharon coached us up, also gave us recommendations for a CSC meeting. The child was ended up able to, um, she tested into scholars to gifted and talented because we were able to really point out exactly, you know, what the constraint skill was and to work on. So in any event, she has been to my school. So I, I actually um, retweeted Emily Hanford the other day, the last um, episode, number four, where she said her um, teachers um, would talk about Lucy Calkins like she was the person, like, well, Lucy said this and Lucy said that. So I retweeted, well, my teachers talk about Sharon Walpole and they say, well, Sharon said this and Sharon said that because they truly do and they remember those experiences with her and we do are just very blessed to have had that opportunity. As far as specific comprehension assessments in bookworms, I don't know that there are any. I don't think they are assessing knowledge. Um, it really is more about the literacy and the progress monitoring of reading, I don't think there are any content assessments. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> across, the high across the high quality curriculum category, the sort of formative assessment that is student work, mm -hmm. really, um, the sort of end of module project and writing and so forth, there's a lot heavier reliance on that than something that looks specifically like a state test equivalent. Um, you right. know, that's just kind of a truism in all of this. And I, having been to schools using bookworms in each of the others, I have come to feel pretty confident that actually teachers' ability to see how kids can write about the content they just studied is actually as authentic a read as anything else. Um, yeah. But I would, I would characterize bookworms as being in line with the others in terms of that aspect of, of progress monitoring. But one thing I will say is that it does have a very systematic and explicit approach to teaching writing. And that's something we did not have before. So our kindergartners can tell you what a subject and predicate is, they can write complete sentences at kindergarten. I mean, we just never thought they could do that before, so that by the time writing happens when kids are older, there are um, obviously rubrics that come with it that are very um, specific on how to grade them, but that's really, I think, the extent to it. So there must be another question out there in the audience. Very good. Um, first of all, I want to inadvertently say thank you to Julie. Um, because of one of your teachers, um, former teachers, long-term subs, and then one of your current teachers whose son I had, we developed a very good relationship, um, and she, they opened my eyes to signs of reading. I've been frustrated with balanced literacy for a very long time, um, especially since I was a struggling reader myself when I was younger. Um, to 
help those kids. I never wanted to be a teacher. I hated school, I hated teachers, I hated all of that. But when my path took me um, to teaching, um, by God's grace, my hope as a first grade teacher was to help those struggling readers. So when I couldn't help them, it's frustrating. So here's my question, pretty loaded. Um, if I want to do right by my students, but my district colleagues slash administrators are not supportive and or on board, what can I do? And if I continue in the direction of science of reading, will I make a difference? That's a difficult question to answer. Um, I was lucky that our journey in the science of reading really came from the bottom up. Do you know what I mean? It was teachers reaching out saying they wanted to make the change. And then being at the top, it was kind of, eight, we were able to bring it together. Um, but certainly, you know, teachers have some autonomy in their classroom to, and you know your students. No one knows your students better than you do. So I personally feel that a teacher needs to do what they feel their students need. Um, in alignment with what district recommends, but it, you know, you have assessment procedures, things like that, that you need to go through for your district. But I would share, you know, ask the why. All of this comes down to the why. Ask your district, why are we doing it this way? Why, just why? Because I think that's one of the biggest catalysts that we had was we really had to stop and look at the why. And once we learned the science of reading why, it made more sense for us moving forward. And our big push right now too is going to be to inform our parents on this is what we're doing and why, and then this is how you can help your child at home so that hopefully we can help parents to understand um, what their children are doing at school. Because some parents are asking, why aren't they coming home with spelling lists? Why aren't they coming home with word rings? And where's the sight words for us to practice? And, you know, because that's what their students or their children did five, six years ago in our district. Um, but things have changed. So I don't know if that 100% answers your question. Um, but I, I thoroughly believe teachers are professionals and can make decisions as well and need to advocate for students. I want to thank you for that question. I want to thank you, and I want you to know you're not alone. You're not alone. You've got a village that's got your back. Nye House has definitely got your back, okay? Um, I wonder, <laughs> for the future superintendents, central office leaders in this room, when you think about change management, what is your biggest takeaway from your lived experience as a leader of literacy? What is your advice on navigating the politics and the challenge of scaling this work responsibly? I, I'm getting, can I answer first? So I've been a principal for a long time, since 2009. I was an AP since 2005. So I always knew culture mattered. I knew how I wanted people to feel when they walked into our building. I knew how I wanted my fifth graders to be known when they went on to the middle school. I knew how I wanted my teachers to feel working for me and the relationship I wanted to have with them. So we had a really positive culture in my school and I was, it's a great place. It's why I don't leave because I just love it so much. But I did not understand how much culture mattered or why it mattered until I had to get them to do this. I had to get them as Kareem Weaver says, to suspend their belief and follow me anyway on something that they're unsure of. And that was really hard to do, but because we had that relationship and they trusted me and, they, and I was able to say, I think what we were doing is wrong. I think how I was leading you is wrong. And I think there's this other way that could ultimately impact kids' lives and just be honest about it. And then I was able, our district was very blessed. We were very blessed, they trained us first. So I was able to fly out and get trained and then come back and say, my mind is blown, I'm so excited. You know, this is gonna be great, we're gonna do this together. But I, I did not understand how much I would need to leverage that until I had to get them to do this. So my biggest takeaway is start with the culture. I would definitely say it's really important, number one, to have the parents on board. Um, you heard from Kareem Weaver earlier, right? Like, parents want their kids to be successful. 
So we work with our parent groups as much as possible to keep them in the loop and make sure that they understand. They sat on the committee with me when we worked on our student success plan and gave us feedback. They even are helping us redesign our website so it's more conducive to parents and their access. But I also think you have to have the leadership on board as well. Um, so it was really important that when we did letters training, I sat through letters training, right? So I actually got certified as a trainer of trainers back in the day because I knew how important it was that if I was going to work with teachers, I needed to know the same things that they knew. So that was really important for me. I can talk the same talk and I can look at the Dibbles data and help them analyze it. I'm not, um, I'm not somebody who's far removed. I get into classrooms on a daily basis. So that is like one of my commitments as a leader that I am in. So I'm, I live at City Hall, right? But I go to a school every day and I walk classrooms and I give feedback to teachers and I ask what we can do to be supportive when it matters, right? So we, we've led initiatives based on some of the feedback we've received in the past. The writing came from the teachers. They said, I, I'm not comfortable teaching writing, I don't think our program gives it enough for me to use. And so we, we actually adopted Step Up because the teachers told us they wanted that. So, but, and I sat through that training too. <laughs> I think it's really important that you have to walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, you have to know what is going on. You have to listen, because sometimes the feedback I get, you know, it's not always positive, right? So sometimes I have to be willing to listen to um, and take some feedback on my own. But I think having the parents involved, working with the administrators so that they're knowledgeable and can support the work, and answering the why. I think that came up when you were asking your question. I think the why really matters. Because if you just told me to go do something and didn't explain to me why it was important, I wouldn't want to do it either. Um, I'm not going to pretend that everything is easy. Like So a lot of times it's difficult. We, and I happen to be in a different situation with a huge district, right, we're the second biggest district in New York State. So when I talk about a training, I, it's at scale, right? So I'm talking about 4,000 teachers when we did the writing training, or you know, several thousand teachers when we did um, some of our other work. So it's important that we get the message out, and sometimes I think that is one of the things I need to work on. I'm not sure I message everything as well as, as I could, so it's one of the things I'm trying to be more cognizant of. I would echo exactly what these two ladies said. Culture is a huge piece, um, and you know, administrators, policymakers have to walk the walk as well. Um, and I would go even further. I, we've had so many wonderful presentations today. I forget which one said, <laughs> you know, that you have to have continued training and continued learning in whatever you're doing. It can't just be a one-day sit and get kind of thing. Um, I think that's been part of our success right now is that we continually keep revisiting this and it doesn't, we didn't learn it and it went away um, like some past initiatives. We were a reading first district years ago. It wasn't rolled out well and it didn't work. <laughs> we had CKLA when it first came out. It wasn't supported well and everybody abandoned it and started doing their own thing. So we kind of had pieces that were heading, you know, pointing us in the right direction, but because there wasn't any follow through um, or accountability for the teachers, and there wasn't a why behind it, it was just here, this is what you're gonna do, because I said so, it didn't work. So I do think the culture, you know, everybody being on the same page and learning together, but then also that follow through and the continued learning, I think is a big piece of that. And I think we have time for one more question. Oh, okay. Um, I am the parent of a eighth grader who has dyslexia. And so we went from listening to the principal talk about balanced literacy in second grade to me saying, no, that's not right, and pulling her and putting her in a private school and going through Wilson. And now she wants to go back to district in ninth grade, having completed Wilson Book 12. And so my question is, as a parent, can you give you know, guidance on what evidence-based progress monitoring or training or curriculum or tools I can be advocating for the 
middle school and high school teachers to be using because our district only just started letters training for elementary, I think last year and the year before. So I have no idea what the middle and high school teachers know or don't know and I'm not sure what to ask for. I mean, letters training can be done with any grade level. So there was a time when we actually trained some of our high school science teachers in letters. That was back a while. But um, that is definitely something that can be scaled up if, if that's a need at the district level. Um, in terms of assessments, it's difficult because there aren't as many assessments geared toward older students. We did have a fluency measure we used to use called the TOSWARF. Um, it's, it's, I don't know if it's ever online at this point, but it was a, a fluency assessment for older students, T-O-W-S-R-F, I think. Um, we are currently using IXL for English and Math at the secondary. Um, they have a diagnostic component that is useful, but I don't know of a particular assessment. We've been using the, um, the QPS, which is the Quick Phonics Screener, and the PAST, Phonological Awareness Screening Test, I think it stands for. Um, you know, but those are really integral in some of our, our earlier grade levels, but at the same point, those are two very foundational concepts that regardless of what age a child is at, that might help determine a starting point. Also, Jim and Diane Murphy um, wrote a book called Thinking Reading, and that's about literacy at the secondary level, and I think that's a good resource to, to start with as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the most exciting things that's happening in the space right now is that we're starting to see the most pioneering states that are making the right investments, um, most notably Mississippi and Tennessee, starting to proactively train upper grades teachers. But this is tip of the spear work, and so I'm, I'm glad to see folks having one-to-one -one conversations um, because I, I don't know that the field yet has fantastic answers. In fact, when I hear a lot of the buzz about some of the most interesting product development right now, there's increasingly investment in middle and upper grades products specifically to fill what I think we all hear and know is a void in the space. Um, so I think our best advice to parents is always about really leaning into those hard questions for districts about where they are and being prepared to unfortunately intervene outside of the system. Um, with that, we are starting to come up on time, and thank you to everyone. Um, all of our panelists have made their Twitter handles, and I know they would make them themselves, you know, kind of available for chats if you have other questions. But we wanted to close because this is a panel about learning journeys, um, and we were never going to get, in fact, today as a day, no one day can ever get to all of the resources that have been instrumental on our panelists' journey or that the field should be looking at. So we wanted to close with each person just sharing a few things that can be your what to do afterward resources. Absolutely, get out your phones. We prepared slides so that you can um, take it away at home, literally. Uh, we'll start with Anne. So depending on where your district is in the journey, I mean, I think the National Reading Panel is kind of a given. Um, we didn't know what the five pillars of literacy were when we first started, so that was a great jumping off place for us. Um, but I do agree there's a couple gaps, like it never addressed spelling, and I think spelling is extremely important. Um, so take it with a grain of salt, but it was very, very useful to us in the beginning when we first started learning about the science of reading. So anything SBRR I think is good, but Scarborough's reading rope and the writing rope, I think it's Sedita's writing rope, um, is also really helpful. I'm currently looking for articles on structured literacy, so I've been combing websites looking for those. Um, letters, I cannot say enough about letters, and it also gives recommendations for particular articles that are very supportive. Louisa Motes, Anything the Woman Writes is gold. Um, Speech to Print was a really great book when I first started on this path. Um, right now I'm really reading a lot about morphology, uh, vocabulary instruction, the history of the English language. We're currently using IMSE to deliver that, but Susan Ebers is also an expert, and she, for a while, had a vocabulogic, was a, a blog site of hers. Um, but I think anything about morphology is fascinating, so I can't stop reading about it. So I added some uh, links here, but <laughs> you can take a picture and look them up anyway. So, um, so obviously, Emily Hanford's podcasts have been shared. Um, I. I'm an adjunct professor at SUNY Plattsburgh, so I teach a couple of classes on assessment, so I've changed it up and just make sure that all of, um, I'm teaching teachers who want to become administrators, so I just really make it a science of reading and science of learning class 
that's called assessment, <laughs> because I think future leaders need to know this, and as we've discussed earlier today, um, higher ed is not preparing them, so we're gonna make sure that our future leaders have this information. In any event, so this is just the list that I use with them. So um, the Curriculum Matters website is wonderful. If you are looking to adopt a new curriculum, um, Karen is the coach of that group, and she um, did a wonderful series last year. Um, it's curriculum adoption season, and did um, there are webinars still listed on the page that you can watch webinars from each of the high quality curriculum groups hosted by teachers and leaders who are currently implementing those curriculum materials, so that's out, an outstanding group. Um, obviously, Natalie Wexler and the Knowledge Gap. <laughs> Natalie, that was on there before I knew you were gonna be here. <laughs> um, Ed Reports in Louisiana Believes are great resources. They are non-biased vetting sites that give you an opportunity to look at some materials. Um, obviously, there's a whole other world out there with Twitter and Facebook with learning resources. Tim Shanahan is a great one, the Science of Reading podcast, and then um, the rest of the folks are here today. Um, I chose to share three resources that we've provided to teachers as we've started our journey, because I know teachers like to have something in hand to kind of help guide them. So one of them is the Road to Reading, which has really helped them to kind of plan out some lessons, and once they figure out where students are at, it, it gives them an entry point for students. Um, we've been using Hegarty for phonemic awareness in our pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade classrooms. Again, it's nice that it's already set, ready for teachers, um, ready to go. And also, um, Dr. David Kilpatrick's book, Equipped for Reading Success, our second, third, or first, second, and third grade teachers have been using that to do some quick drills with students, again, to practice that phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. So actually, all three of us use Hegarty. Yeah, so we're using it K2, K1. And just to wrap up, I have a couple of recommendations of my own. I was gonna echo um, Kathleen's recommendation of Curriculum Matters. When I was thinking about what to recommend, I actually thought about how proud I am to be a New York educator who has the privilege, and I don't use this lightly, of getting out to districts across the country who are doing this work. So I've been in a whole bunch of bookworms districts, not unfortunately Kathleen's yet, I gotta work on that. Um, but one's in Delaware and um, down in Georgia. And so I, I thought about where would I send you that is doing the best job of helping educators to give voice to their work and give windows into this work um, nationally, um, including Boston Spa, but also beyond. So Curriculum Matters is a great district, that, a great resource that is all dedicated to centering educator voices to tell their curriculum-centered stories. And I, I also love that series. If you want to hear what people really want to say straight talk wise about these high quality materials, I'd go there. The Knowledge Matters campaign, which does go out and visit districts that are using these knowledge building curricula Natalie mentioned, um, just relaunched its website to release this library of videos of interviews with educators doing this work across the country. So that's another resource because again, there is really no substitute for hearing it from people doing the work in districts. And then I, I also think that Twitter is where this conversation continues to break. And I, I would point you to uh, accounts like, uh, you know, Margaret Goldberg and the Right to Read Project, who I think are doing really remarkable work at putting out blogs that are ever so timely. Those things tend to drop first in Twitter. But I also find a few of us have touched on parent advocacy and how much parents are driving this conversation. Um, parents maybe are, are the most unvarnished in putting out the screenshots of like, this is really what the latest Lucy Calkins curriculum looks like. So it's accounts like um, Baron Chuda Montoya and Aurora War Blue that are giving some of the, the clearest views into what they're seeing in the latest and greatest classroom. So I'm not really sure there's a substitute for being on Twitter to see all of those things dropping. Um, I, I threw my handle on there because I try to share the most current stuff. There's an ELA chat handle that does nothing but retweet science of reading related topics, so I could never list enough things, but if I had to point you one place, it would be the ELA chat handle, because it's kind of the, the whirling dervish. Um, and with that, we just want to thank everyone for taking your time on a Saturday that's running long for having this conversation with us and for everything that you all are doing to move the needle for kids and to all our panelists for sharing their wisdom.